You're listening to the Brick by Brick Podcast. Welcome back to the Brick by Brick Podcast. I am John Erico here, as always, with Ryan Goldfarb. We are very excited to bring you another episode of the Brick by Brick podcast. This time we're focusing on a topic not related directly to Atlantic City. So if you're here for that content, then we're not going to be talking specifically about Atlantic City. But we are going to be talking about um, short-term rentals as an asset class. Um, And I think it's a really important and interesting topic um, and also prescient to what we do, which is invest almost exclusively at this point in short-term rentals. But we're going to give some context as to why we think short-term rentals are deserving of the title of an asset class, asset class being something like multifamily or commercial or residential or whatever, Um, some history, some context, and our thoughts for the future. So Ryan, I know you've thought a lot about this. Do you want to give us a little roadmap and lead us off in the discussion? Yeah. So I guess there are a few different lenses I wanted to look at this through. Um, I think one lens we can discuss is the capital markets lens. Secondly, we can talk about regulatory lens. Thirdly, we can talk about, I don't know if this is even a word, but the institutionalization of the asset class. Um, Next, we can talk about the demand side. Um, And then I think we can, throughout, we can, you know, chime in with some examples um, or some facts based on our experience in the space um, with some of our assets and just general observations that we've seen from the market. over the last probably two, three years, because I think I think one thing to point out is that this is like already in, I would say, emerging asset class. Yeah. And as such, it moves quickly. So I would say there's been considerable movement already just in the past two, three years. Um, and I think some of those changes were only accelerated um, with the pandemic, you know, almost two years ago at this point. So um why don't we start a little bit with some definitions and some historical context? Because I think something that's weird about short-term rentals is that it kind of, you can, you can talk about STRs um, similar to you talk about like a single family home. And you can also talk about STRs similar to how you might talk about like a hotel or a motel or something like that. So maybe we can start just with the history kind of like what does an STR mean in this context and like how did it get to here from, from where it was? Yeah. I guess the most, I guess the way that I would classify an STR for the purposes of this conversation is just broadly uh, furnished rentals. Um, Those furnished rentals could be rented out on a nightly basis as true vacation rentals. They could also be rented out as, you know, more akin to what people think of as corporate rentals, which are generally on a one to three or three to six month timeline um some some would even i think some would even say short-term rentals um would encompass anything that is uh, a lease duration of less than 12 months Mm -hmm. yeah i've sometimes used the the term medium term rentals to encompass that although i don't know if that's exactly what we're getting at but um and short-term rentals um just to use that word to describe everything ryan just said um have not they were not invented recently. They weren't invented by Airbnb. A lot of people say, when we talk about what we're describing, they say, oh, an Airbnb. And that kind of irks me because, first of all, there are a lot of platforms besides Airbnb. And second of all, Airbnb didn't necessarily invent this market. Um, short-term rentals in this context have been around um, really forever. Um, they've been around since housing kind of began in the way that we talk about it in that if you're looking for a furnished room or whatever else, a furnished apartment that has existed, you know, throughout at least, you know, the United States for hundreds of years. Um, it's only in perhaps the, you know, more touristy areas, um, of the U S and obviously I I don't, can't speak to the rest of the world, but in the U S where short-term rentals is kind of like a hotel replacement have really existed. Um, uh, which is what I think most people think of when they think of Airbnb, but even that has existed, you know, for example, Atlantic city has been, around Atlantic City since um, the 19th century, right? People have been renting out places in Atlantic City in a home or in a rooming house, a boarding house, whatever, since that time. So that's been around forever. I would, one other distinction that I would make, at least for the purposes of this conversation, because this is primarily how we apply the phrase short-term rentals, but we're generally talking about entire dwelling units. So we're talking about either a full apartment or a full house. Um, But there are people who think of short-term rentals as being renting a furnished room within a house or within an apartment and maybe having three listings for a single apartment Mm -hmm. 
broken up by each bedroom. A sublet type. Right. Yeah, almost. Yeah, right. Um, I think the reason why short-term rentals have garnered this discussion that we're having right now and kind of the cachet of being its own asset class has been the proliferation of the internet and the ability to rent rooms um, without a lot of you know, the, the friction associated with that in the past. Um, I think, you know, that kind of dovetails with the Uber effect and whatever else, the sharing economy, whatever you want to say, where people become comfortable kind of at the idea of occupying someone else's home or whatever else, although that's not necessarily what an STR is because a lot of the ones that we operate are um, purposely either built or used as STRs, but conceptually that's kind of the, the friction point. And so to that end, things like Airbnb, VRBO, um, even Craigslist um, have helped facilitate the rise of the, the ubiquity of, of this product. You know, short-term rentals might have existed forever, but I think in the 20th century, most people would, would not think of that as a as a real thing outside of maybe the boarding house or rooming house context, which has probably mostly died in the U.S., uh, at least as a kind of reputable place to live by the, you know, later quarter of the 20th century, at least. Yeah, and I think a big part of it is also that you have this behemoth in Airbnb. Um, I just looked it up. The market cap as of today is about $115 billion. Mm. So I think whenever you have a company that uh, that has obviously that has that scale, but that has achieved that scale so quickly. Um, I think it, it sort of like change, changes people's minds about um, even industries that have been around for dozens or hundreds of years. Um, so in this case, it's Airbnb. In other cases, it's Uber. I mean, people use Uber to mean a taxi the same way people say an Airbnb to use, uh, the same way people say Airbnb to mean a short-term rental. Right, right, absolutely. So given all of that, I mean, I, I, I don't have the data, the numbers exactly. That's not what this discussion is about per se, but the number of Airbnbs, short-term rental properties, whatever you want to say, that exist in the U.S. today versus 10 years ago, um, you know, I, I don't know what order of magnitude it is, but we're talking about a thousand X, maybe 10,000 X or something like that. So it, it's something that has exploded over the past 10 years for certain. For sure. So Ryan, to to guide us back a little bit on our, our roadmap, do you want to start breaking down some of these topics that, that you had thought about? Yeah, um, I guess we'll just go in the order that I have them written down. So the first, the first kind of lens through which I think we can look at the maturation of this asset class is capital markets. Um, so this is something that we deal with on a very regular basis. I would say almost every time we go to obtain a loan, um, whether it's for an acquisition or a refinance, we we experience firsthand the lag between how the capital markets and specifically the debt markets look at an emerging asset class and how investors do. Yeah. So to us, you know, we see we see the revenue, we see the the P and L, we see the cash flow, um, and obviously there is a lot of upside to that. It is certainly a strong performing asset class for us. Um, but we also see the flip side, or maybe even what we can call the downside of this strategy, which is that we just have to abandon this short-term rental model. And um, sort of our plan B in a lot of these cases is that we would just go back to renting these out as long-term rentals. So we'd put them on 12-month leases. Um, and in our minds, that's a mitigan that a lot of lenders can can use to understand the downside um, and to gain some comfort in lending to this asset class. But because it's still relatively new, most lenders do not, or there's not a universal standard by which most lenders will, will underwrite loans on this asset class. So when you do find a lender that's going to, to lend on this asset class, they will generally have either higher rates or some more prohibitive terms um, or higher fees. And that, you know, it's not a reason, it's not enough to drive us out, but I think what we will see over the coming years is that more lenders, and we've already seen this, um, is that more lenders will view short-term rentals as a viable strategy that um, 
and they'll they'll better learn how to understand the risk, which is really what they're doing when they're underwriting any loan. Yeah, I think institutional lending capital markets are by their nature conservative in this sense. And you know what we're seeing, as Ryan alluded to, is that you know to use like nuts and bolts examples, we'll have a property that generates say fifty or sixty thousand dollars in revenue. And we'll take that to a lender and say, you know, here, here is our revenue, um, and we want to base our, uh, our our appraised value or the amount of money we can loan or whatever on that number. And they will say no because either they don't they don't lend to short term rentals at all, which is the most conservative strategy, or um, they will base that number on what they think the long term rental revenue of that space will be, which in our case could be a tenth or less of what we're actually generating. So, um, you know, and I, I think I think the only rationale that I can, I, I'm, I'm sure that lenders have ways of justifying that. I'm sure they think in their mind, oh, well, short-term rental revenue is variable. So in year one, it's different than year two, year three, it's sensitive to the economy, yada, yada, yada. You don't have lease commitments. Or they might think uh, the regulatory environment for short-term rentals is variable, and maybe what they do will be illegal next year or whatever else. Um, you know, and to us, I think that's a little bit—it's a little bit silly, particularly given what's happened over the past few years, when uh, with COVID nineteen and the pandemic and the eviction moratorium and whatever else, we've seen that having a twelve-month lease, which I think in the eyes of a lot of institutional lenders is like the gold standard, this 12 month commitment to pay rent really doesn't mean a whole lot. Because um, if a government, uh, a state or the federal government just says, okay, well, if they don't feel like paying because of these other exogenous issues happening, there's really no recourse. Um, that that's a huge problem, you know, in my mind, that that makes that asset class much riskier um, than it would otherwise. And kind of when I look at short term rentals, I think, well, yeah, I mean, I might have downturns in the tourism industry or whatever else. But, you know, I'm having these people in every three, four days, five days, people have financial problems. That's only an issue for a very small amount of time. Someone cancels a booking, I'll get another one or someone else is coming the next week. So, you know, that that um, I think just to take like one step back, the fact that lenders even recognize that there is something called a short-term rental is a big step forward. Because I remember in 2014, um, 2015, when I was buying some of my first properties, um, that wasn't even something you would disclose to a lender. That would be like, they wouldn't understand. It sounds like you're doing something illegal. You know, It sounds like you're running a bar out of your, your house or something like that. Yeah, I think to play devil, devil's advocate for a second, um, in in your example, I think... The, I think where we're trending towards is certainly not that lenders are only going to look at underwriting a short-term rental based on how it would perform as a long-term rental. Um, but I also don't think it's to going to be underwriting the asset strictly as a short-term rental. I think the ultimate resolution will be that lenders will look at it maybe on a very conservative basis based on SDR performance, knowing that they have some downside protection that these properties can be ultimately converted back into long-term rental uses. Mm -hmm. And I think what drives a lot of this is not necessarily an individual lender's lack of willingness to understand the asset. I think it is really a, a capital markets issue. So the way that most of these lenders work is that they they originate the loans, but they originate the loans based on this kind of predetermined box um, for what they can originate because they have this essentially guarantee from lenders or from institutional debt funds on the back end that, that will essentially stipulate that if you originate a loan on a property that fits this box, 30 days after closing or immediately after closing or 60 days after closing, whatever it may be, we will, we will take this note off or take this loan off of your books. And if you made this $300,000 loan, we will give you the $300,000 for this loan. And then we will collect the interest on the loan and we will service the loan. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's really not, I would say it's really not like the lenders themselves that don't understand these loans. And frankly, it's probably not the debt funds that don't understand these things either. I think the issue is when a new asset class is still in its infancy and there's not a huge track record for how that asset class performs over time, it's very hard to create a universal standard by which each of these lenders can go ahead and comfortably start committing to buying these loans at massive scale.
I think that's a great point. Yeah, I think that that's a really significant observation because a lot of times we, a lot of times, not even in this context, but people look at lenders and complain about, oh, they can't approve this, can't do that, all these requirements or so, whatever. But the requirements are not necessarily at the lender level. I mean, they could be, but they're more driven by the back end, if you will, the capital markets. Because again, most lenders, most originators that are sort of, um, you know, from the the name banks like Bank of America, Chase, whatever, they are immediately reselling these uh, these notes to anyone but them. They're, they're, it, you'll never find Bank of America servicing their own one family uh, mortgage, uh, or at least I don't think so. So, and and even the at the end of the day, it's a market. So in this case, it's a debt market or a capital market of some sort. And even. Even if you have, let's say, local banks who would be holding these things on their balance sheet for a long period of time, even if they can understand this and conceive, like, could hypothetically be comfortable lending on it, the reality is it's all sort of like a, uh, it, it's all driven by what the competitive landscape looks like. So if the biggest players aren't doing it, then a lot of these smaller lenders have less incentive to do it mm -hmm. um, unless they really, really, really want to take an aggressive stance towards an asset class that they believe in mm -hmm. and start getting exposure to that asset class. But I think what's either going to happen is that more and more of these local regional banks are going to start doing it um, and they're going to gain more and more volume and these, inst uh, these debt funds are going to realize that there's something to this or... One of some of the bigger debt funds are going to finally roll out products that cater to this really at scale, um, and then everyone else is going to follow suit. All right, at risk of turning this into an episode on short term rentals as an asset class, specifically through the lens of capital markets, I think it's time to transition to regulation. So, um, I guess the two questions that I have under regulation, um, in terms of understanding the, mat the maturity of short-term rentals as an asset class is, uh, is how universally are they regulated? And then secondly, how much stability is there to that regulation? Mm -hmm. um, so I think to speak to the second point, um, it's one thing to have regulation for certain asset class or for certain product or service or whatever. Um, but it will, it will, if there's not certainty about how that will, withstand the test of time it's going to leave people with a lot of um, skepticism or a lot of reluctance to enter that asset class so i think as more municipalities more states put laws on the books um, about how they're going to regulate these asset classes and perhaps more more importantly how they're going to profit off of these asset classes in the way of taxes um, i think the longer that the longer track record we can establish of states and municipalities doing that without reversing course and changing their attitude on that, um, the more confidently someone, some of these like larger institutional players and even lenders, uh, the more confidently they will be in jumping into these asset classes. Yeah, I think it's a great point. It, it kind of reminds me of you know the Uber problem, right? Which is, I think Uber and ride sharing is maybe like five or ten years before you know um, home sharing, Airbnb, short term rentals type stuff. And that I recall, you know, five plus years ago, maybe ten years ago, when Uber and Lyft were really exploding onto the scene, there was all this regulatory uncertainty. To your point. Um, about how how that would work, um, New York City had a different law than L.A., than Paris, than Barcelona, than Rome, and um, I think it, by and large that has kind of resolved. Um, I think there are still different regulations in some of these cities, and it's still shocking to me when I show up somewhere and you can't use Uber. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, by and large, those regulations are kind of set, so you know that if you're going to you know China, for example. You're not going to be able to use Uber, but you could use the Chinese equivalent of Uber, for example. Or if you go to, I can't think of a city where Uber is actually banned, but I think there are still some cities where you actually just cannot use Uber, um, but at least that it's been that way for some time. So I think, Ryan, to your point, we're at a stage, notwithstanding what the regulations are, we're at a stage where we're still in flux about what regulations will be in a lot of areas. Like where we invest, for example, Atlantic City, the regulations governing short term rentals were just enacted as recently as a year ago. I think I think almost a year ago exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, reenacted. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Reenacted about a year ago. There had been regulations in the books about so that's another thing, right? Is that there are regulations that exist 
kind of sort of in this realm, right? There, there are regulations in Atlantic City about vacation rentals, um, which is kind of sort of what we're talking about, but not exactly. Um, or there are regulations that say you can do this or you can't do this or doing an STR would be really prohibitive because you have to get a new CO every time someone moves in or something like that. So it's not a ban of an STR per se, it's just saying it'd be really hard to do that if you were to follow the letter of the law. Yeah, and I think uh, you, you touched on something with the, the CO equivalent for each tenancy that I think highlight, or that, that I think is even more of a, a more relevant topic for the, the medium term stuff that we talk about. Mm -hmm. So um, I think... I think one way that we've talked about kind of circumventing or, or operating short-term rentals, quote unquote, short-term rentals, furnished rentals, whatever you want to call them, um, within the auspices of certain cities' regulations is to say, okay, they, they may have a ban on short-term rentals, but that short-term rental ban generally, uh, that short-term rental ban is for 30 days or less. Um, or rentals of 30 days or less so naturally 31 days starts to become conversation we've you know we've done that with we've done that successfully in a few different towns um but the sort of like added layer on top of that if you're talking about do, talking about doing that type of thing at scale is what other um what other bits of regulation trickle down into that type of tenancy mm -hmm. so in this case it's it's those those co requirements um, upon tenancy and um, we can talk about that in, in a different context maybe down the line but um sort of like one of my predictions long term for this asset class is that i think that that medium term stay is going to be an increasingly prevalent concept that people start to accept more um, i think I would not be surprised if five, ten years down the line, the number of you know, young people fresh out of college, that young professional class, I wouldn't be surprised if fewer and fewer of them start committing to 12-month leases in lieu of doing one to three-month leases in different cities and bouncing around for either based on seasonality or based on different work projects or based on sort of a fluid employment situation. Um, I think there are a lot of arguments for doing that type of thing, but that type of regulation would certainly uh, could hamper the ability to do that. Yeah, so I think we're right now, you know, we're at a regulatory space, I suppose, where the regulations are different in every municipality, every state, every county, you know, and that creates a lot of difficulty for S-tier investors from an institutional kind of um, asset class level a and B, a lot of those regulations change. But I think, again, to take one level of extraction up, the fact that this is part of the conversation kind of affirms the prevalence of this in in the country um, because municipalities are now thinking about, you know, how do we want to incorporate STRs at all into our mixture of properties? And again, you know, the arguments for STR uh, for and against for a municipality are, you know, against is, well, you're bringing kind of a quasi-hotel, quasi-commercial use into a perhaps residential area. Um, you're increasing noise, um, traffic, disruption, et cetera, in a place where maybe there isn't that or there are, you know, quiet streets, quiet families, whatever else. Um, the pros for a city are, well, now we can get more revenue because we can tax this activity happening in this house. We can bring more people into our city, which then will drive uh, our businesses or commercial areas, which frankly are, are where most cities drive their rateables from anyways. Um, and possibly we can improve the housing stock in general. I mean, this is my argument for Atlantic City by encouraging this type of investing, um, going into houses that might otherwise have been not in great shape and making them to, to a higher standard. So these, these are the same pros and cons um, that in different actual pros and cons, but conceptually similar that cities encounter when they were doing Uber regulation, right? Uh, or ride sharing regulation saying, should we allow private vehicles to be taxis? You know, what are the pros and cons of that for how our city is going to look? At risk of butchering everything you just said, um, I'll leave it at that. That was very well put. Um, moving on, uh, let's talk about it a little bit through the lens of the institutionalization of the asset class. Um, so under this umbrella, uh, a few of the things that I had written down were who are the operators of the existing properties in this asset class? 
um, who is buying these investments going forward, um, what type or how prevalent are brands within this asset class. Um, so I guess to start it off, do you have any do you have any thoughts on that specifically and how that impacts the the sort of future outlook of the industry? I think that we've seen a trend towards insti- institutionalization uh, of all the aspects that you just suggested. Um, I think you know when I think of short term rentals or vacation rentals or whatever historically, I think of someone owning their house and renting out some spare rooms or a spare apartment or a floor, an attic, whatever. Um, and that's probably as, you know, mom and pop as you can get because it's literally someone renting out their own house. I'm certain that there were, you know, vacation rental operators that had multiple properties or whatever else. And um, again, you know, when, when we start blurring the lines between a short-term rental and a hotel or a boutique hotel or whatever you want to call it, that has been an institutionalized sector since you know the 1940s 1950s in the same way that you know restaurants became institutionalized um as a class at that point so um to speak specifically to short-term rentals you know in a sense you could say well airbnb is the ultimate institution right because they uh, facilitate renting uh and they're a humongous company with a over 100 billion dollar market cap currently so that is kind of um a, a tremendous sign, I think, for the market acceptance of this as an actual thing. I think perhaps what you're getting at more, Ryan, are, you know, are there institutional investors that are buying STRs, that are branding STRs, that are marketing STRs, that exist to facilitate the management or um, whatever of STRs? I think to all of those questions, the answer is yes to a varying degree of what we're, you know, what we're looking at. Right. Yeah, I would sort of break that down into two stages. I think the first stage is brands evolving uh, naturally within that asset class. Um, and I would say like that's brands like Sonder and Common and Vacasa. I don't know how, to, how they pronounce that. Um, Evolve and I think Domeo is one. Mm-hmm. Lyric was another, although I don't know if that, I don't know if that survived the pandemic. Um, but I would say that level of institutionalization has been happening for several years at this point. Um, I think some of them have even gone public perhaps, mm-hmm. um, or at least have raised considerable sums of money like Sonder has for sure and Common I know has. Um, and then I think the second stage of that same concept is beyond those sort of organic brands growing from within the new industry. It would be some of the some of the legacy players in the hospitality sector coming in right. um, like a Marriott or a Hilton or a Hyatt. I think um, we've seen that effect already at, at a lot of these properties like Marriott, Hyatt, Hilton's where there'll be the hotel and then there'll also be like a village essentially where right. you can rent out kind of like an apartment mm-hmm. or a house, but it's part of the you know Marriott complex. In fact, I just stayed at a place like that at Lake Tahoe where there was the hotel and there was also the you know three or four bedroom kind of casas or whatever you want to call them um in some other location casas spanish for house very good yes um and then i think there's even another another arm to that where i I think at some point we will get to the point where companies like hilton will have they will have their hilton branded hotels they were they will maybe have like a an adjacent um village of you know villas and casas uh nearby casitas (laughs) casitas nearby um that you could rent if you want slightly larger accommodations and then i would not be surprised if we start to see these like separate collections of single family houses or small multifamily buildings um that offer more akin to what you see from mom and pop str operators but they you know are probably owned and operated or maybe licensed through the hilton brand the mm-hmm. hyatt brand whatever yeah one interesting thing to point out, I think, has been that we're now seeing, uh, in fact, we are part of this um, trend, if you will, um, ground up construction, purpose built construction for STRs. And I think that's a huge step in the institutionalization of it because typically a mom and pop operator is going to go out and build um, a purpose built property to do short term rentals on. But an institutional investor or someone, you know, kind of more sophisticated in the market will do that because they really believe in in the class, you know, in the same way that um, 
probably 100 years ago would be uncommon, well, maybe longer than 150 years ago, would be uncommon for someone to build a hotel. Um, but now it's extremely common. You don't retrofit existing buildings as hotels generally. You build purpose, you know, from the ground up, you build a hotel. And if you're maybe operating a new hotel, you're just taking an old hotel and renovating it. So um, the fact that that is now happening throughout the country, I think, speaks to kind of how. Uh, mature this class is becoming. And I think on the flip side, if we look and say, you know, what's the activity of of actual big developers, private equity funds, et cetera, how are they interacting in the space? <clears throat> There's not a tremendous ton of activity, I think, of a big, you know, name brand fund that is investing in short-term rentals. But certainly, again, we are among the smaller operators that are you know, working in a more institutionalized way to to do this at a broader scale. We have a fund, you know, maybe it's one one thousandth of what uh, a humongous real estate fund is, but we have that. We have all the, you know, accoutrements and kind of um, uh, processes that we need to operate a fund that we are deploying in the short-term rental space. I know there are others that are, that are doing the same thing. So we, you know, that's a great sign, I think, for the class that there are these operators moving in to do to do this at scale. Yeah, I think that's a great summary of the uh, institutionalization of the industry. And I, I think there's a lot to, uh, I, there's a lot to look forward to in that respect for sure. Um, I think that as it, as it starts to reach that point of institutionalization, that's also probably when we will start to see an industry wide saturation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, at that point when that really starts to happen, I think that might be a good time for for us and other operators to sit back and think, you know, maybe this is the time to sell, or maybe this is this is time to start like tempering expectations in certain ways because perhaps the at that point the the largest examples of growth are behind us. One big thing that I, I I'm curious to see what will happen is the the pricing on resale of properties, which are STRs based on their STR income, because right. I think we're still seeing, and that's kind of the the entire thesis of our investing. Right for SDRs is that we're buying the arbitrage that we're buying stuff priced as long-term rentals or single family homes or whatever, but we're operating them as short-term rentals and generating a lot more revenue than we would otherwise. Um, if, if, and when the price is adjust to say, okay, well you can operate this as a short-term rental. So it's going to be worth, you know, three X what you paid. That will be a big turning point because that will be really broad recognition that, yeah, you know, these properties are worth more just because of their particular use. We're seeing that a little bit, I think, in, cer in certain markets that are really STR heavy, uh, maybe like Orlando, Miami, to some extent where we're operating in Atlantic City, but we're not quite there yet where, you know, one given home might be 3X another home because it's an STR available home. And, you know, maybe maybe zoning laws have to get there, maybe licensing has to get there, something like that. But but we're on on the path. Yeah. Um, I'd like to pivot to some demand side effects. Um, so a few things that I had written down are, what are the use cases for SDRs? Um, everything that I can think of already exists, but I th think the outlook is largely going to be dependent on the proliferation of these uses in the future. Um, so I think we've talked about sort of like the the common understanding of what people have when they think of an STR nowadays and you know maybe for the last like five, 10 years, um, they're generally thinking about something that is either a person renting out a room in their house and a way to find like a cheap uh, or an inexpensive, simple, straightforward accommodation in a new place um, or a an opportunity to find suitable accommodations for larger groups, i.e. a single family home, as opposed to splitting up a large group across multiple hotel rooms. Um, I think what we're starting to see now in, in this sort of new era of short-term rentals is that you have, you have sort of a, an emphasis on quality stays. Um, you're not just looking at, people are not just looking at staying at short-term rentals, or sorry, at Airbnbs or VRBOs, because they are less expensive than a hotel, they're starting to look at staying there because they are better than a hotel or they offer a different type of experience mm. than staying at a hotel. Um, and then I think a little bit about what John just talked about um, going forward is this idea of like built to suit short-term rentals. Um, so things like that might look like 
certain venues that are built you know, almost exclusively to be um, short-term rentals in a different realm or in a different vein than what a hotel might be. So that might be um, built in, like building in certain types of experiences. Um, it may have certain perks that are included that are more akin to what you'd find in a country club. Um, it may have things that have a structure that's more reminiscent of what people are used to with a timeshare, um, or it may be something that something reminiscent of of having a vacation home of your own. Um, so I think there are all sorts of different paths that this can take going forward, um, and I think we'll probably see a little bit of everything in the space. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that all of these all of these use cases are probably ammunition for why STRs are here to stay and why this asset class will continue to grow because a platform like Airbnb is very good, frankly, at catering to all different types of things. Um, I would say it's not really biased towards any one of these types of uses. And the beauty of the platform is that it allows you to search for exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. I think briefly we can conc conclude by discussing what we think the future of SDRs. I know you touched on that a little bit, but Ryan, I know you had some interesting thoughts earlier about medium term rentals and um, furnished rentals and all of that. It might be fun to expand on that a little bit as to where we see things going uh, broader trend wise. Yeah. I, I think our anecdotal evidence suggests that there's already a lot of demand for this medium term stay model. Um, but I think that that's here to stay, and I think that that uh, I think that will only increase over time. I think that consumer tastes are going to increasingly accept that as a norm, and I would not be surprised if, as I said before, we start to, it starts to become more and more commonplace for people to completely bypass a twelve month lease of an unfurnished space and um, adopt a more nomadic lifestyle of going from. STR to SDR, maybe to back home to spend a few months with family, um, and then hitting the road again. And I think there are all sorts of reasons why people might do that. Um, there is you know, flexibility based on what you seek in a given season. You know, maybe you want to be in Florida in the winter and New York in the summer. Um, maybe you have a more flexible work arrangement than previous generations. Um, maybe there's less stickiness to one city because of those work accommodations. Um, I think there's an economic argument to this as well. Uh, if you're fresh, if you're fresh out of school, especially, or a young professional, you probably don't have a ton of cash in the bank. So the idea of doing a furnished rental and, um, being able to bypass that upfront expense of furniture, um, there's definitely an ec economic argument to that. Um, and I think that there's going to be increased supply of those types of things too. And, and I think that that's going to sort of marry with the demand at some point. Um, we were talking about this before, but there are, there are even like institutional players, large multifamily operators that are carving out certain segments of their portfolio to do this very thing. Yeah. I think that there are, there are pull and push reasons, which make it very compelling, right? There are reasons that you might desire to do it. And the reasons why you might be forced to do it in a sense, like we have seen, apartment vacancies at all time lows recently. Um, that's even post, you know, COVID, um, <clears throat> vacancy rates are very, very low throughout the United States in general. Also the cost of rent generally has gone up, um, even beyond inflation at almost everywhere. Um, we've seen credit requirements, um, to rent an apartment, get more difficult, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all these factors point towards, um, a medium term rental, like Ryan said, being, more the norm, which I think feeds into the asset class, because, um, again, if, if you think of, you know, like what we do in a lot of places are, you know, we consider short term rentals, but we have had people there for weeks and months at a time. And in fact, in many of our places, we prefer that. Um, and I've done that before with, um, students on J one visas and things like that. And so it, it's, um, if you're not aware that this exists, you're sort of behind the times, I think, because it's already prevalent. Um, and I, I think it just makes economic, I, again, you know, 100 years ago, was it the case that someone graduating from college would go out and buy an apartment or rent an apartment, furnish it um, by themselves, live alone? 
I would think no. I, I don't think that's that's common. I think they would end up living in some sort of, um, I think the word you used at some point, Ryan, was dorm-like housing, which could be a boarding house, a rooming house, something like that that existed in more prevalence 100 years ago, and I think will exist again in the form of these furnished um, short-slash-medium-term rentals. Yeah, and I think one one fact that remains is that there's a, a shortage of housing supply in this country right now and probably worldwide, aside from some of those ghost towns in China. Um, but because of that supply of housing, I think it stands to reason, or at least there's a case to be made, that one solution is to more efficiently use the existing housing supply. And if that takes the form, or if short-term rentals provide a more efficient means of using that existing supply, then there's you know sort of a, a macro reason to support this change. Um, and you know you can also you can also sort of engineer. I'd be curious to see if anyone has done a, a deep dive into um, sort of a what if scenario of what housing would look like in the United States if 12 month leases ceased to be a thing. Hmm. So like what would what would happen to housing prices? What would be ha- what would happen to I don't I don't there's so I feel many like ways some to- that would be scary for a lot of places and for other places it would be awesome, right? Like I think there, if you don't really have to live in wherever, you know, uh, it may be an undesirable place to live. Why would you ever live there? Right. I mean, that's kind of like right. not to say that people are chained places, but I think, you know, for major yeah. metropolitan areas where people want to live, that's like, that's awesome. But for maybe some place in middle America where already there's no one lives there, it's kind of like, well, uh, you know, I yeah. Know. I mean, obviously we sit, we sit here from a point of privilege where the idea of moving from city to city is not as daunting to us as it is to somebody right. who doesn't have the financial means just right. to make that move, um, nor do they have the career flexibility to do that. Right. But um, yeah, I think I think as with any major change, there'd be winners and there'd be losers. Yeah. Um, I'd like to think that the world would turn out a better place for it, but who who knows? Do you have any parting thoughts, Ryan, on this on this topic? Um, I guess the main takeaway that I have is. We are going to see a lot of changes on the supply side. We're going to see changes on the demand side. Um, And I think it'll be really interesting to see at both the micro and macro level how that supply supply demand dynamic works at scale and works like at as this industry starts to reach maturity. I think that that's well put. And I I think we we will look back on this conversation in five or 10 or 20 years and say, you know, this is the beginning of this asset class in in the sense of it being, you know, that when I I talk about asset class, I I think of it kind of like, you know, investors say, what do you invest in? Say, I invest in multifamily, single family, commercial, industrial, retail, whatever. Self-storage. Self-storage. This is going to be part of that thing where people say, oh yeah, I invest in short-term rentals. That's part of my portfolio that's part of my investing thesis whatever else and we're, we're getting there right now i think in 20 years it's going to be like of course you know of course that's something you do i would also i would also say that i think we're going to see uh an increased blending between short-term rentals and hotel motel use mm-hmm. um i think there will probably like like i don't think a lot of the properties that we have today that are standalone single family houses anyone will ever confuse for a hotel or a motel but i would say there's going to be a different understanding of what those di- like it's yeah. kind of like the next era of hospitality i think is going to encompass all of those things i think yeah the way that i think about it is i think that hotels are going to become specialized i think right now a hotel is kind of like a ubiquitous thing that you do when you travel and i think that in the future there will be certainly be hotels but they're going to be very high-end hotels which appeal to a certain client they're going to be cheaper hotels that appeal to a certain client they're going to be hotels that offer this hotels that offer that extended stay extended stay a kitchenette versus sure it's not going to be like i'm going somewhere i need to stay at a hotel what's the hotel it's going to be like i'm going somewhere i want to have a particular type of experience and that experience is going to be at an str or it's going to be at a hotel it's going to be at whatever else so it's going to be like like the one stop the one stop fits all kind of you know one size fits all hotel is, is going to go away I think. Um, <laughs> Stay tuned in 10 years. We'll be <laughs> retroactive. 
as thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. We really appreciate um, your feedback. If you'd like to talk to us about this episode, have any questions or thoughts, or would like to even be on the podcast, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Email is the best way to contact us right now. My email address is john, J-O-H-N, at libertyhudson.com. And I'm Ryan, R-Y-A-N, at libertyhudson.com. If you are able to like or subscribe or follow uh, the podcast or us or specific episodes on your podcast listening medium, we'd really appreciate that. It helps us to figure out who listens and how people enjoy our episodes. Uh, until next time, uh, we will be back next week with an episode of the Brick Brick Podcast. And thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Will. You're listening to the Brick by Brick Podcast.